You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday, the 26th of June, 2013. Over 4,000 officers disciplined for criminal behaviour in five years. A £14 million jail in Somalia, and you're paying for it. Neely Mosque opens its doors to Rochdale Primary Schools. Germany raids targets model plane bomb plotters. Six arrested in French anti-terrorist raid. Shias, the Arab Spring's latest victims. Old Satan ballistic missiles should be converted into an anti-asteroid defence system, says Russian scientist. Thought for the day, why don't the British? And finally, boredom in Hemel Hempstead. UK News. Over 4,000 officers disciplined for criminal behaviour in five years. More than 4,000 police officers were disciplined for criminal behaviour in the past five years. They include an inspector who was sacked after being arrested for shoplifting and a PC who resigned after installing a camera in a lady's toilet. A sergeant in Lancashire was also sacked after he was discovered with three submachine guns and ammunition. A colleague from the same force resigned after being caught drug trafficking. Shocking new figures obtained through freedom of information requests show criminality among the crank and file of Britain's police forces is on the rise. A £40 million jail in Somalia and you're paying for it. Senior military figures have warned David Cameron not to cut the foreign aid budget even as it emerged British taxpayers will fund a £40 million new jail in Somalia. Nine prominent figures, including former chiefs of the defence staff, Sir Mike Richards and Lord Syrup, say international aid is crucial to the UK's national interests. They wrote in an open letter that aid addresses the root causes of conflict and helps to spread effective government in failing states to stop them becoming lawless. Comment. At last, a bit of common sense. It costs 40 grand a year to keep a prisoner in jail. Multiply that by 400 Somali criminals currently in UK jails equals £16 million. Spend £14 million on a new jail in the long run, big savings for taxpayers, and it gets rid of the scum back to Somalia. M-M-I-C-K-K, Blackburn, United Kingdom. World at Eight says, True, but the best way is to stop immigrants coming in, thus obviating the need for putting some in jail in the first place, and not giving any money towards Somali jails at all. What did they do in years gone by before the stupid Brit governments? Neely Mosque opens its doors to Rochdale Primary Schools. The Neely Mosque held its annual Primary Schools Week long programme last week. 21 primary schools from across the borough took part. Each school visit went through some basic fundamental beliefs of Islam in a fun and interactive way, followed by a tour of the mosque which highlights some of the key functions and features within the building. Ruhel Khan, Primary Schools Programme Coordinator, said, The Primary School Programme 2013 was a massive success. This was our sixth year and each year it seems to get bigger and better. The programme took almost six months of planning and the demand for places is getting higher each year, with all the allocated slots being taken up several weeks before the start of the programme. From the launch in 2008 to present, more than 5,000 children have taken part in the primary schools programme. Mosque Secretary Imran Ahmed said, The mosque has a responsibility of educating the wider community on Islam, especially with the current climate, and our schools programme is just one of the many initiatives we take. Neely Mosque is part of the UK Islamic Mission, UKIM. The UKIM is one of the oldest nationwide Islamic organisations in the UK. UKIM has different strands of work which include relief, education, running mosques and supplementary schools, as well as community cohesion and interfaith activities. UKIM is a registered charity organisation as well as one of the founding members of the MCB, a national umbrella body for Muslim organisations in Britain. 
World Today says, what a wonderful propaganda tool this is, beloved by our establishment lovies and directed at our children. What next will they devise for getting to know a Muslim week? I dread to think. But as Rochdale is another heavily enriched area, possibly most of the teachers and pupils are already Muslim. European News Germany Raids target model plane bomb plotters. German authorities said they had uncovered a terrorist bomb attack plot to use remote-controlled model planes and carried out raids targeting seven people alleged to be involved in the Islamic plan. Elite police unit stormed nine sites in southern and eastern Germany as well as Belgium based on suspicion of preparation of grievous acts of anti-state violence. As well as money laundering, the Federal Prosecutor's Office in the southwestern city of Karlsruhe said in a statement. The searches targeted two men of Tunisian origin suspected of acquiring information and objects with the aim of carrying out radical Islamist explosives attacks using remote control model aeroplanes. World of date states, and still we welcome them in the UK. Six arrested in French anti-terrorist raid. Six people were arrested in the Paris region on Monday in coordinated raids in members of a suspected radical Islamist cell allegedly planning terrorist acts on French soil, a source close to the investigation told AFP. The suspects, aged between 22 and 38, were all known to police for serious delinquency and are being detained by the police anti-terrorist unit in the Paris suburb of Les Valois. The members of the, of the suspected Islamist cell include one man from Benin, another from the Comoros and four French nationals, a source close to the case said. They are suspected of being involved in the hold-up of a branch of the Banque Postale in seine Amman in April and apparently planning to commit other armed robberies, the source close to the investigation said. According to the anti-terror police investigators, they were planning to commit terrorist acts targeting well-known figures in France. World News. Shias. The Arab Spring's latest victims. The US-sponsored Arab Spring continues to expose itself as a Sunni supremacist takeover. While the indicators are many, from the Al-Qaeda Benghazi constant attack to the ongoing persecution of Christian minorities, attacks on Shia Muslims are also on the rise. In Syria, where foreign Sunni jihadists, supported and armed by the United States, are attacking all non-Muslims, Christians are prime and obvious targets, and reports of church attacks, abductions of Christians and their slaughter are many. Shias, who are seen as false Muslims, are naturally also under attack. For example, Salafi Sheikh Yasir al ajani recently issued a fatwa saying that those Muslims fighting to topple secular President Bashar al-Assad and install Sharia law are free to capture and have sex with all non-Sunni women specifically naming President's Assad sect, the Alawites, as well as the Druze and other Shia branches. Days ago, popular news outlet Syrian Truth posted a photo of a toddler living in the Dar el Azor governorate in eastern Syria along the Iraq border, who was reportedly tied with chains to a fence where she witnessed the killing of her Shia mother and father at the hands of the Sunni jihadists making the ranks of the Free Syrian Army. Syrian Truth correctly describes them as takfiris, that is Muslims who, like al-Qaeda, accuse and slaughter other Muslims, in this case Shias, for not being true Muslims. And now in Egypt, where Shias make roughly 1% of the nation, a Sunni mob reportedly numbering in the thousands, also described by Arabic reports as takfiris, attacked the home of the spiritual follower of Egypt's Shia, Sheikh Hussein Shahata, killing him and four of his followers and wounding dozens of other Shias, that had congregated at his home. The mob descended on his residence last Sunday, savagely beating him and his followers with sticks before setting his house on fire. World Date says, These are the same fundamentalists who open their mosques in the UK for our children to walk around and see what fun they have. This is the true nature of Islam, at war with the world and each other, in short, a perpetual state of friction and misery. And you want our children to see that? Old Satan ballistic missiles should be converted into an anti-asteroid defence system, says Russian scientist. An old ballistic missile system should be modified to defend Earth from asteroids, a Russian scientist says, citing a major explosion over the Urals earlier this year. The Soviet-era SS-18 Satan heavy inter intercontinental ballistic missiles 
were ideal for conversion into a rapid reaction anti-asteroid system, said senior rocket researcher Sabit Satgarayev at the weekend. Mr. Satgarayev of the State Rocket Design Center pointed out the destructive power of the meteor, which burst over the Russian Ural Mountains on February the 15th. The sonic boom of the airburst blew out windows and damaged thousands of buildings around the city of Chelyabinsk. Around 1,200 people were injured. Some 50 were hospitalized. NASA believed the space rock to have been some 50 meters in diameter. Mr. Sagarev said that the old 1960s era Soviet Stalin missile, Satan missiles, were ideally suited to such an interception role as they could be held ready for launch for up to 10 years. Thought for the day, why don't the British? You may think I'm always slamming the Muslims and the Brits, and to some extent you would be right. The Muslims were coming over here and the Brits were encouraging them to get away literally with rape, murder and the genocide of the English tribes. And true to type, it's the Brits' turn again. Why don't the British become more British in the face of the many strangers who clearly don't want to integrate, become British, or in many cases even speak the English language in the jobs they manage to steal from our own? I'm having a day when I've been faced personally with the now only too common attitude of the average Brit in some sort of second-rate position on a council body. Without becoming an utter bore, I thought I'd been referred to a muscular skeletal unit within the very large and beautiful custom-built hospital which is supposed to serve the Borden community in all its glory. After checking with the GP who'd written the letter two weeks ago, I thought I'd wander into the hospital which is adjacent to the GP's practice. On approaching reception, no one was there and I waited in the usual English fashion, muttering darkly to myself. When the receptionist arrived, I knew her as our chairman of our residence association, so told her off for not being there as a joke. She told me that it'd be better if I rang the MSK people, as they only visited the hospital either twice or three times a week from Basingstoke. I asked her exactly what the hospital did do, as it was a custom-built place which would always appear as empty, and she told me a fact that ruined my day. Now, I don't have a lot of time for custom-built estates with all the pubs and shops built around, which is why I chose Borden, because they haven't done that. But they have built a huge hospital some years ago to cater for the people of Borden. Does it? Does it hell? The few beds they have left are due to be taken away altogether this year, owing to the cuts inflicted on the Hampshire County Council. Poor Adam Carew, our Lib Dem guy, was in tears at this decision and is at odds with his party over this awful move, which in fact makes an entire huge custom-built cottage-type hospital a white elephant in the community it was built for. It's being turned into a health centre, which means exactly what. It means that already emergencies are being taken to either Frimley or Guildford A&Es, which are in Surrey, or Basingstoke in Hants. Surely the meaning of having a custom-built hospital in an area means that the people of that area should benefit in times of emergency or when they need it. Having a large area turned over entirely to daycare and physio needs is not serving the communities for which it was intended. Now, I'm all for cuts in the right places, but are our government cutting the right things? No, they're not, is the short answer. They're cutting the armed forces, certain local councils, housing and regeneration, social care, the voluntary sector, children's services, education, and of course the NHS is being cut to the bone in one minister's words. As for the elderly and their pensions, these have always been the worst in Europe, and as a new saying goes, goodbye pension, hallo equity release, which is the most terrible way to end your life, poor and in debt, and leaving nothing to the next generation to help them. But perhaps that's all part of the plan for us Indigenous Brits, the closing of the final economic door. What I can't understand is that whilst we're busy hammering the nails into an already finished coffin for us Brits, the newcomers amongst us are not finding the way quite so tough, and are still being funded and helped by a government already in crisis after the labour years of financing everything going without the means to do so, or as their ancestors did on the Never Never. The awful and unbelievable stunts pulled by certain housing and council facilities to accommodate people who have never paid in one penny to any of the services which are being corrupted and bankrupted to, the ho to house, educate and service these strangers are never-ending. 
In an email I got yesterday, a short and not very sweet message was given. We Brits are either very generous or very stupid, and I can't for the life of me work out which. And I quote, Two million home for Muslim family of nine, along with 90,000 benefits each year. Whilst a former soldier, Robert, nine years on the front line in Iraq, now living with family in hostel. Two million home for Somalian family of ten, including a hundred thousand pounds refit to improve it for them. Whilst former Sergeant Mark, 19 years service, shot in Afghanistan, now homeless. Two million pound home for Somalian family of ten, fathers never worked since arriving in the UK, whilst former soldier Craig served frontline in Afghanistan, now homeless, with his family. £1.2 million home for Afghan family of eight, of eight single mother gets £170,000 a year benefits, whilst soldier Michael, two tours in Afghanistan, told by council to live in homeless hostel with his family. It doesn't make sense, does it? Homeless go without eating, elderly go without needed medicines, mentally ill go without treatment, troops go without proper equipment. Veterans go without benefits that were promised, yet we donate billions to other countries and excessive immigration before helping our own first. 1% will repost and 99% won't. Have the guts to repost this. I know I'm in the 1%. And so was I. You read it in the papers, but it never goes on the TV or on the national news. And it should because it's affecting our people and our country. Not some country in the third world which is begging for help. Now that is something our liberal lovies really go for. Helping total strangers who, within a few years, will end up on our shores taking our homes, jobs and food. You think I'm joking? You know I'm not. It is not a matter for jokes or laughing when there are food banks opening every day in certain areas and without fail it is our white English who are having to take advantage of them. Not the many and wealthy Islamic communities or the thousands of other ethnic blots on our landscape. Every immigrant costs us money, whether it be indirectly with free education and health care or directly with loss of jobs and a tremendous strain on the farming methods to provide food for these parasites. And yes, they are all parasites. And we are the host. Make no mistake about it. For the most part, our immigrant population is not made up of self-sufficient working or professional people. It is made up of people who come from countries they've turned into hellholes, or they are the uneducated and uneducationable who want to earn money to send back home. And to them, our minimum wage is sheer heaven. Put that with everything virtually free for them, including cars, mobile phones and food money, and we are operating a food bank for the rest of the world when the money is simply not there anymore. So the time has come for austerity, and it means austerity for us, not for immigrants. We are already accommodating thousands of Eastern Europeans living in squalor in our capital city, as they did in their own hometowns. Nothing has changed, just that we are paying for them to muck up our country. If you think that is bad, wait for the influx of Romanians and Bulgarians next year. And don't think they're worse than the Muslims. They aren't. They're just as bad. Only a different colour, but often not a different religion. As Islam has spread its oily coils all over Eastern Europe. In fact, it will mean a rise in crime, prostitution, TB and other diseases, and also a very steep rise in us having to pay for these people to be educated, fed and housed. Our successive governments have never listened to the people, let alone its nationalists, but they do seem to listen to Marxists and Muslims, and this must stop. It must stop because there comes a time when the people who have been born in the country and who have paid into the system for many years find that the government of that country have failed them in their time of need. And that failure is 90% owed to the foreign invasion of that country. The other 10% is the European and global recession. Then the time has come for people to unite and fight because it's clear our government is not going to do it. We, the people, have tremendous odds against us. We have the ethnics themselves, who certainly don't want to change the status quo, the corporations who don't because they're making money, the politicians because they have no intention of ending their days in this country as it will be, various bodies who have also made money out of committees and quangos relating to ethnic minorities, 
and the institutions of law, both the police and lawyers, all of whom have had to jump on the ethnic pride bandwagon. Do you know they're still keeping sodding Stephen Lawrence in the news after 20 years? If Charlene Downs had been black, they would have made a much better job of punishing her killers and would still be pontificating about her, when, in fact, all is silent on that front, of course. And indeed, if Stephen had been a Stephanie, ethnic and abducted, raped and prostituted by Muslim gangs, they'd have made more inroads into that particular problem and not lumped it all together with certain Pakistanis from certain communities. It seems it is one law for one and yet another for us. But facts are facts. We need to cut back if we are to survive. But these cuts are to the wrong things for the most part. We shouldn't cut our armed forces. We certainly shouldn't cut our NHS and we should not cut our education systems. The public sector service has been overmanned for years, usually through an inrush of foreign workers anyway, so you can cut those. My husband worked for years for the civil service in the probation department and it was overrun by coloured workers because they had to give them jobs as it was feared they would play the race card. In fact, one African girl who worked for my better half couldn't write or read properly and they had to send her on a course to do so. How is that for ridiculous? Our government should stand up for our people and our country. Cut back, yes. Cut back and stop all future immigration, regardless of where or who. Send back all illegals forthwith. Repatriate the huge amounts of peoples who do have large countries they fled from, which have been receiving large amounts of foreign aid for many years. Tax foreign businesses to the limit. Prevent foreigners buying large acres of land, which should be used for feeding the British people, not building houses for foreigners or religious edifices. Rethink the education system to make English schools more English. English should be mandatory as, as would English history and culture. The few foreign children to remain will become British citizens when their education is completed. Leave the EU. For a few years it would be tough, but not as tough as certain people say. They usually have an agenda anyway. We must keep our money and become more self-sufficient and leaving the EU means we save millions both in future expense for paying for the European immigrants and at the same time paying the EU for the pleasure of having them. For our country's sake, look carefully at abortion rates, discourage single girls from getting homes for having multicoloured kids, encourage marriage between male and females, homosexuals can have civil ceremonies and the same financial rights as other couples, but elevating them to heights above heterosexual couples is wrong. Don't put our name forward for Olympics, World Cups or anything along those lines as no one really profits in the long run in the UK except the foreign workers who come over to work and stay. This will not happen. At the end of a long list but which should be at the start is the awful amount of foreign aid we still give the world and which is protected by the government from any sort of cutback at all. And this amount will be up to 2014, almost the entire amount of our national debt. That is £50.8 billion pounds going out of this country to other nations, most of which send their illiterates over to us anyway, so we are paying double bubble. EU students are at a record high in this country and the amount of government money handed to EU students has topped £100 million pounds for the first time and we are a bankrupt country. It's not racist to want certain monies curtailed or stopped to make sure our elderly are looked after, our children are educated, our poor and homeless are no longer in that state, and our country functions for our people, and it's short-sighted and stupid to think that it is. But that is what we nationalists and the ordinary man in the street is up against, bigotry against one's own country and its people, and this is dangerous in today's financial crisis. If it came down to it, what would you want? A thriving English community and a country with a light sprinkling of professional ethnic workers and some of our old West Indian Christian immigrant communities? Or a country that is a disaster area? No NHS, no free education, no houses, no land, no food and no future. Well, well, not for us Brits anyway, because it'll all grind to a halt. The more foreigners that are allowed to come in and make use of it, and nothing lasts forever. Money certainly doesn't. We will all have to think along these lines if we want to survive. We can live with austerity cuts. We just cannot live with the cuts as they are and the unfairness with which they are distributed, especially in the light of the billions of pounds we send out of this country 
in a time when every penny counts. I'm not an economist, but I am a housewife, and that counts for more in the ways of making a mickle out of a muckle. And finally, there's not a lot to do in the London suburb of Hemel Hempstead. Reported in the Telegraph and Daily Mail, when even the Facebook page Hemel Hempstead is boring, 728 likes, with little attempt to tempt the reader other than a notice of a bathroom supplies showroom opening and an invitation to a free Zumba class in September last year. Perhaps it was the lack of entertainment options around that prompted an unnamed man to stick his head inside a movable traffic sign where he got stuck for two hours. Footage of the incident taken by a bystander shows a policeman and one of the man's friends attempting to free the prankster. John Waterman, who filmed their attempts on his mobile phone, told the Daily Mail that the man in the bollard didn't seem too distressed, but was very red in the face when he was finally freed. Whether that was from exertion or embarrassment was not clear. It took his friend and a policeman to get him out. It needed a good heave and his back was badly scratched afterwards, Mr Waterman said. The police officer found it very amusing and was chuckling to himself. It was probably one of his more light-hearted call-outs. This presenter says I saw the video and the reaction was typically British. No one really took any notice until the police came around. They thought it was a joke. That's the problem with us Brits. No one takes any notice until it is too late. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I'm Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>